you very much, Dr. Dagan. Our next speaker will be Simeon Frang. He is the middle school principal here at Reese Puffer. I just want to welcome you all to the middle school. And uh, how many of you are Reese Puffer, live in the district, resident type people? Cool. How many of you are outside of Reese Puffer, resident type people? Just really quick informal survey. Thank you very much. I just kind of curious, that's all. As I get set up here, we're all here for a reason tonight. And what I'd ask you to do is turn to someone sitting by you. Maybe it's a person you came with. Maybe it's someone that's new. And just maybe share with them as I switch the computers over what it is that brought you here this evening. And then what it is you're hoping to walk away with. Maybe you already got some great things from the first presentation. But what's one thing you were looking for tonight that brought you out? And one thing that you hope to walk away with, OK? So go ahead, do that, and I'll be right with you. But what I want to talk about this evening is not just only what does this look like in school, how does this play out in school, but a lot of times what we see when a child is diagnosed or, or they're told that they have something is they begin in their mind to formulate an opinion of themselves. And so rather than me sitting up here and you listening to me, screen time, we know people engage really well, so I've got somebody else you can listen to on the screen. The gentleman that you see up there is Sir Ken Robinson. Uh, he is actually from England, so he's got a bit of an accent. And what you're going to hear him talk about is uh, creativity. And I'm not going to preface, preface anything else about the clip other than you're going to hear one man's take on creativity. And the third thing about intelligence is it's distinct. I, I'm doing a new book at the moment called Epiphany, which is uh, based on a series of interviews with people about how they discovered their talent. I'm fascinated by how people got to be there. Uh, it's really prompted by a conversation I had with a wonderful woman who make, most people have never heard of. She's called Gillian Lynn. Have you heard of her? Some have. She's a choreographer, and everybody knows her work. She did Cats and Phantom of the Opera. She's wonderful. I used to be on the board of the Royal Ballet in England, as you can see. And uh, anyway, Jill and I had lunch one day. I said, how do you get to be a dancer? And she said it was interesting. When she was at school, she was really hopeless. And the school in the 30s wrote to her parents and said, we think Gillian has a learning disorder. She couldn't concentrate. She was fidgeting. I think now they'd say she had ADHD. Wouldn't you? But this was the 1930s, and ADHD hadn't been invented you know, at this point. So it wasn't an available condition. You know, people, people, people weren't aware they could have that. Anyway, she sent, went to see this, um, this specialist. So this oak panel room, and, and she was there with, uh, with her mother, and she was led and sat on this uh, chair at the end, and she sat on her hands for 20 minutes while this man talked to her mother about all the problems Gillian was having at school. And at the end of it, um, because she was disturbing people, her homework was always late, and so on, a little kid of eight. In the end, uh, the, uh, the doctor went and sat next to Gillian and said, Gillian, I've listened to all these things that your mother's told me. I need to speak to her privately. So she said, he, she said, wait here, we'll be back, we won't be very long, and, and, uh, and they went and left her. But as they went out of the room, he turned on the radio that was sitting on his desk. And when they got out of the room, he said to her mother, just stand and watch her. And um, the minute they left the room, she said she was on her feet, moving to the music. And they watched for a few minutes, and he turned to her mother, and he said, you know, Mrs. Lynn, Gillian isn't sick, she's a dancer. <laughs> Take her to a dance school. I said, what happened? said, she did. I can't tell you so how wonderful it was. We walked in this room, and it was full of people like me. People who couldn't sit still. People who had to move to think. Who had to move to think. They did ballet, they did tap, they did jazz, they did modern, they did contemporary. She was eventually auditioned for the Royal Ballet School. She became a soloist. She had a wonderful career at the Royal Ballet. She eventually graduated from the Royal Ballet School, found, found her own company, the Julian Dance Company, met Andrew Lloyd Webber. She's been responsible for some of the most successful musical theatre productions in history. She's given pleasure to millions, and she's a multi-millionaire. Mm. Somebody else might have put her on medication and told her to calm down. Mm. Now, I think... <laughs> what I think it comes to is this. Al Gore spoke uh, the other night about ecology and the revolution that was triggered um, by Rachel Carson. I... We're not going to go on and listen about Al Gore. We're, we're going to stop it there. One of the things that stands out to me in this video is that every individual, every child is different. And when we talk about 
kids and when we talk about children, we have to identify and really get to know and understand what works for that individual child. And I think one of the important pieces in schools is that when we see a child come to us who has ADD, who has ADHD, what, whatever version or variety is, we really want to try and understand more. Is it, is it organizational? Does the child just not, with the organization, is that, and you go and you open the locker and you can see it, and you can open the locker and you can see the things come cascading down out of the locker. And, th and then there's the hyperactivity. I, I, you see me up here and I'm moving, I have to move. And so it's how do we really get to know and understand the child? Because our goal in school is to help the child. Um, I think that in a lot of ways, a question that I get asked often is about looking for an answer or the solution. And I don't know if there is such a thing. I think it requires trial and error. It requires some effort because certainly we have kids in this building who have ADD, ADHD, who aren't necessarily receiving any outside support or outside services from a special education perspective. We have children who are learning how they, their bodies, their minds work, and, and they're finding ways to become who they're meant to be without necessarily receiving some type of a label that says special education. So let's, let's shift gears a little bit. Let's talk about what that looks like. And, and I, I brought some notes. Our, our staff and our special ed department were kind enough to provide for me a, a few notes to go over with you today. And so what I thought I might do is I might summarize a little bit uh, rather than going over those four pages. Um, the students who have an impairment, a learning disability, students who have a, a learning impairment, they, they struggle to learn. And if ADHD is preventing a child from learning, the, that's given a label and it's called otherwise health impaired. So it doesn't necessarily mean if a child has ADHD that they would be receiving support for special education services. It depends, and again, I'm, I'm thinking in terms of a spectrum, and, and there's, there's obviously black and white, and, but there's a spectrum within that, how severe that, that would be. And so what we really try to do is identify how can we support this child. A lot of the supports can come outside of the land, the realm, the world of special education. And I'm just going to go over a few of them here for you. What it might look like in the classroom for a teacher would be to display constant visual cues. We've got these boards like this in all our rooms. Mm -hmm. So there are a lot of visuals that are already going on in the classroom for kids. Another one might be have the, allow the child to record a lesson using, using an iPhone or an iPod. And I'm, I'm timing because I don't want to go over my 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. um, but using some way that they can then go back and re-listen to that information later. Um, for some students, having the visual timer helps, that they would know every five minutes, OK, what am I doing? What should I be doing? So there's, there are a lot of different things that, that we can do to really try and help support the students that we have here in the building. And then those are things, again, from home as parents that you can do to help support as well. Now, my nephew, uh, who's now in the 11th grade, has ADD. And back in the eighth grade, back in the seventh grade, he hit that, that rough patch where he was bringing home D's and he was not doing well in school. And through a lot of the things um, that were spoken about earlier, in terms of the medication, in terms of the progressing through that therapy, behavior modification, he's able now, he's got B's, he's got A's, I'm taking him on a trip this summer, we're gonna go look at colleges because that's where he's at. And it's really kind of cool to see him get to that spot on his own. One of the things that's really interesting is he likes history. So picture in your mind, child with ADD, ADHD, that likes history. The young man will sit down, he will crack a book open, and he's, he's gone, he's there. And he'll sit there for hours. We have students who have ADD, ADHD, it's not necessarily the hyperactive type, but they can sit motionless in a tree stand and hunt for hours on end. 